Okay, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And thanks to our guests, which we'll meet in a few minutes, uh, for episode six of the Power of Music series from the We Are All Music Foundation. We're going to talk today about the essential role of music in mental health and social emotional learning. I think this is going to be a really exciting conversation today, one that I'm deeply passionate about. Uh, we'll spend about 45 minutes, about the last 15 of that will be in a Q&A. So please uh, add any comments throughout this, uh, questions in the chat, uh, so that we can see what you're interested in and we can make it as robust as possible of a conversation. Let me go ahead now uh, quickly for those uh, music nonprofits and grantees that are also joining us today. I'll let you know uh, that we are having our grants season again this spring. And uh, I think the thing uh, to know is that you can reach out to us uh, at any point in time. And our applications are due March 31st. You can learn more about it on our website. And you could uh, always talk to Mary Crawford, who is our managing director, to learn more about how to apply. And we're very excited to be hopefully adding more uh, more capital and more more grantees to the mix of, of, of organizations that are truly helping uh, children and helping the people all around the world. Let me go ahead now and introduce some of our guests here. Okay, so first, Dr. Kim Sable Flores, welcome. Kim is a true leader in the field of, of SEL, social emotional learning and positive youth development. For the past 30 years, Dr. Flores has focused on creating environments that promote positive youth development. She's conducted international research and evaluation projects that highlight the value of social and emotional learning on long-term success. But more than that, she's identified key practices that are often used in arts and music programs to promote very positive outcomes. Dr. Flores has authored several books and publications on youth-led evaluation, organizational learning, and is the founder of the American Evaluation Association Topical Interest Group, Youth-Focused Evaluation. Now, Kim's company, Hello Insights, has been uh, very interesting for the Real Music Foundation. We, we started to look into tools to better evaluate uh, social emotional learning and to quantify impact and to see how programming can be improved within all music organizations across the country. And her company, Hello Insights, has become an important solution for understanding the unique impact that our grantees are having on students through music and mentorship. We're going to hear a lot more about that. Now, Chad, who joins us, Dr. Chad Bernstein uh, from Guitars Over Guns, one of our grantees that we are all music foundation. Chad is the co-founder and CEO of Guitars Over Guns uh, and is a leader in incorporating mental health and research-based initiatives into after-school programs. In 2015, Chad was honored as a CNN hero for his work and has been featured by Steve Harvey Show and People Magazine. Most recently, Chad was named an inaugural recipient of the Elevate Prize, selected from among thousands of global change makers. Chad is currently serving as a governor on the board of the Recording Academy. And most important, he remains one of South Florida's premier Latin jazz and funk artists. Very exciting. Now, last but not least, our very own Peter Gerling, who is the director of research at the We Are All Music Foundation. Peter has spent over 30 years devising ways to identify and evaluate top tier asset managers and their investment strategies and worked on behalf of dozens of sophisticated institutional investors across Europe and North America. More recently, Peter began to devote his energies to understanding the growing array of data analysis and machine learning tools that have the potential to vastly better understand the dynamic world as it evolves around us. He advises a handful of clients who are seeking out strategic guidance a wide variety of due diligence matters, and he brings these same due diligence tools to bear in helping the We Are All Music Foundation build its proprietary research repository and all of our analytical tools. So welcome, Kim and Chad, Peter, 
Uh, this is going to be a great conversation. We're going to talk about why music programs are the ultimate delivery mechanism for social emotional learning, uh, how to create safe spaces for children so they can take risks and increase confidence as they grow. We're going to talk about the technologies and tools that are out there so that nonprofits can better measure their impact and, and, and we can as a music category really show corporations in the world the real extensive impact that we're having. And uh, we're going to then hopefully tie it all together in terms of how we can get the word out as a category and how music nonprofits together can collectively make changes in the world that are very positive for children and for um, social causes. So let's kick off with Kim. Uh, what, Kim, is social emotional learning? What uh, We've heard a lot about it in the last five years or more. You've seen a real acceleration in uh, districts adopting initiatives for social emotional learning. And I would like to know what's behind this interest and acceleration, what's behind uh, the it all, and, and what exactly if we had to simplify it, is social emotional learning. Tell us more. Well, I won't read the official definition of um, social emotional learning or SEL, but what I will say is it's been around for a really long time. It's not um, anything magical, but it's really talking about whole child development or the whole person's development, which really leans into things like um, emotional well being. Uh, ability to empathize, to construct a positive sense of who you are in the world, and to be able to really manage your emotions so that you can kind of set and manage your own goals forward in life so that you can thrive and kind of be the person that you want to be. So it's all those skills that we tended to kind of not talk about so much, but that are so critical, actually, and what we've learned through research is that they're so critical for other long-term gains that folks are often talking about, like academic success and college college and career readiness. And we know that when young people have these types of skills, that they're much more likely to do well in school, to do well in life in, in the long run. And um, they're really critical right now, I think more than ever, as we are coming through this pandemic and we're seeing mental health you know, really um, issues on, on a massive increase. A, a US Surgeon General said that there's an increase at an alarming rate since 2019. So it's more critical that we talk about these issues than ever. And I think, um, I think, um, you know, uh, there's just a massive amount of money being poured into about $271 million being poured into K-12 right now, um, trying to focus on building structures and strategies to support well-being. And I think the reason that that's so important is you know, while we're talking about the gap that happened, the kind of educational gap that happened and the, the learning loss that happened, we're also understanding that we can't just catch young people up by giving them more content. We need to step back and focus on the overall mental well-being of young people because they can't learn when they're under massive stress and when they're when they're when their lives have been turned upside down and they're not quite so sure of their future. It's hard for them. You know, it's hard for their brain to to learn under stress like that. So I think it's more critical now than ever. And I think it's really exciting to be in this room talking about the impact of the arts and music on mental health, because I'm a firm believer that the kinds of uh, the kind of environment that arts creates and folks like Chad's program at Guitars Over Guns creates really does promote and we're seeing in our data at Hello Insight how much these kinds of programs are promoting um, strong social and emotional well-being. So I'm excited to be in conversation to learn more from Chad about what that's looking like in his program. But we're we're seeing that arts programs um, and music programs in particular foster um, foster mental health in ways that um, maybe folks hadn't even thought about before. No, that's a great it's a great kickoff for this conversation. And Chad, let me turn it over to you. Tell us a little bit more about Guitars Over Guns. Uh, what is the organization's mission? And you've recently uh, taken a pretty big step forward to incorporate mental health initiatives directly into the programming. Uh, tell us how that evolved and, and, and the mission uh, that you, you seek. Sure, yeah, uh, thanks. And it's great to be here with you all. You know, our mission is simple. It's to empower youth through music and mentorship. And uh, you know, we believe that all young people should have the opportunity to discover who they are and reach their full potential through the power of music and uh, the power of mentorship. And, and that's really 
you know, to Kim's point, music is such an important part of what that vehicle towards creating those transformational mentorships can be. Uh, and is really the origin of the organization is seeing how uh, music can break down those walls and transcend those barriers and allow people to really build lasting relationships that unlock that potential in youth. And, uh, you know, the organization started with 15 kids and five mentors 13 years ago and, and has grown into a, a sizable organization that's serving, you know, this year will be about 1300 kids between Miami, New York, and LA in over 30 programs, uh, 30 sites. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's been an incredible journey. And through that journey, we've seen the evolution of need and also the evolution of um, what we feel called to kind of provide for our kids. And particularly in the last several years and, and, and a total godsend that we started this work before COVID happened, but uh, the inclusion of mental health as something beyond just me calling a friend of mine that was you know, in, in the field of psychotherapy to say like, hey, I'm dealing with this situation, can you give me some guidance? Um, what we've seen really happening over the course of the 13 years that we've been doing this work is that as a result of being as close to the kids as we are, which can you know, happen in a bunch of ways, but for us through creating those, uh, those relationships and, and creating those truly safe spaces where kids can feel like they can be their full selves and be celebrated for their full selves, which as we all know, you know artists, that's what we bring to the table is like having done the work to really know who we are um, music and the arts foster that spirit and allow us to connect that to the rest of the world and, and understand what our place is in it. And if you can create that situation for a middle schooler or a high schooler at a time in their life where they feel most threatened to be their full self, um, then that's a really powerful thing. And, you know, what we've seen as a result of the professional musicians that are able to foster that by really bringing out, like, it, you know, let's say you're really curious to play the piano but you love uh hip-hop and you know i can teach you how to play piano through a two chain song where the piano line is dee, 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 dee. and that's the thing that like fires you up and you're like oh my god you know come here like i need to show you that i can do this and like having those early successes those those are the building blocks and the experiences that allow us to form those relationships that over the course of a school year you know, you go from those early things to like really deep foundational, who are you? What are you trying to express? And as a result, what, do you, you know, how are you defining success? How can I help you get there? And what are the obstacles that are standing between you and success? And when you start to uncover those obstacles, you start to uncover some pretty foundational uh, blocks in the road. And, and some of those are, are certainly and more prevalent than ever in the mental health world. And so, you know, suicidal ideation and domestic violence and abuse and trauma, uh, trauma as a result of poverty, you know, and, and the populations that we work with, um, we're working with youth that are at or below the poverty line. And so generationally and systemically, like some of those traumatic uh, experiences are, are a function of uh, the world that our kids are living in. So if we're not providing some of those things, then they're going unmet. And those are needs that we've just, at this point in our evolution of, as an organization, have decided that these are things that we need to do internally. Mm -hmm. um, and so we brought mental health in. We brought it in in January of 2020, um, which you know a few months before the pandemic has been truly a staple of our program and will continue to be a staple of our program moving forward as now a full-time position at Guitars Over Guns. And does that mean that you're, you're going to have mental health professionals in the programming at the school? Yeah, so we um, had a really, we, we've been building a partnership with Florida Blue, who's made a significant investment into our ability to do this. But what started as a pilot program in January of 2020 um, was a part-time uh, licensed care social worker that was managing a program that was overseen. Um, and then we partnered with neighboring universities to provide masters of social work students to be implanted into our program sites. And what that did was, was four real main things. One was to uh, allow us to identify students in crisis that, that needed support in the moment, which was critical. 
Uh, the second was to identify the circumstances that are allowing for students to express those things and then how our mentors need to handle them uh, to develop professional development around those areas. Um, and then lastly, to foster a space where our mentors who are dealing with kind of the intake of all that trauma have a way to uh, talk about and vent and express that and build the skills that they need, uh, you know, not only for themselves, but for the students, most importantly, and, and how to help navigate those spaces. And, you know, in our conversations, what's really interesting, and you brought this up, it's, uh, I asked originally a question to you, well, why does the mental health program uh, need to be in the programs? Why can't it be separate or with the parents? Or And, and you said, well, there's a cost issue, there's a transportation issue, there's a uh, parental issue, there's a denial issue, uh, it's not my kid. Uh, so just spend a brief minute talking about that and, and that conversation we had in terms of why it's just so critical at the point where a student is opening up to a mentor at that moment of vulnerability to be able to address it. So I think mental health and now we're starting to as a society adopt and accept mental health as a necessary part of our lives but think about you know when i was growing up or when you were growing up like mental health wasn't a thing that you did was not something that was celebrated going to see a psychiatrist was meant that there was something wrong with you not that you were trying to seek and improve who you are uh, or your capacity to deal with the situation that's amplified um you know in in the communities that we serve where culturally that is you know it's stigmatized and there's just not you know that generational trauma that trauma does not get processed through therapy that's not the way it's like you know rub some dirt on it or suck it up or, or all, all the kind of things that we've you know the uh the phrases that we've heard years over years you know to to kind of deal with it and suck it up and move forward and and now we're starting to unlearn those things but um, what we're seeing in the children and the families that we serve is that that's not, you know, the universal, like, oh, yeah, okay, I, mental health is something that my kid needs. It's like, my kid's not going to see it, uh, whoever. And so if you package that in a clinical and sterile setting, you're only exacerbating all of those stigmas. And so if we can bring it in-house and mm -hmm. instead of, you know, doc, you're going to go see Dr. So-and-so and sit on the couch, you're gonna go see Mr. Dave and you know talk to Mr. Dave, who you've known this whole year, who you love, who's engaged in music making with you, who's learning, who's vulnerable, who's sharing these spaces with you, and is just another adult that you trust in the room to talk to that has a skill set that maybe you don't have. Is no different than going to a musician that has a skill set that you don't have to learn a song that you want to learn. Yeah. So if we can package it in that way, we can start to break down some of those barriers. Absolutely. So Kim, back to you. A lot of schools. Uh, you know, the principal is told, well, okay, the district, we're going to have social emotional learning. Like, we're going to teach the kids how to empathize <laughs> um, through these specialized programs. And, and then yet half the kids in New York City don't have access to a music program. Uh, and you see this throughout the, the country. And it seems to me that if we can reframe music as uh, a delivery mechanism for social emotional learning, we can accomplish almost a few things at the same time, right? Uh, we can accomplish the things that Tab was mentioning. We can, we can, we can get music programs also into schools. What have you seen specifically about how music can uh, really deliver this type of learning uh, compared to other types of methods? Uh, and I know you've worked a lot. You know, uh, I know you're modest, but you, you your, your your company now works with over 2,000 nonprofits around the country. Um, from sports to arts to music to all sorts of different programming. So what are you seeing in the general world uh, and how music can compare and contrast to other delivery mechanisms and, and anything else that you could add there? Yeah, it's for us, what we're seeing time and time again is that it's not what you're teaching young people, it's how you're teaching young people. And, and the how is what's critical, right? And, and so what we see is that 
things like building a positive relationship with young people and checking in with them and finding out how they're doing and, and finding out what's going on in their personal lives outside the program walls mm -hmm. and building those critical relationships where you're challenging young people to do things they didn't think they could do, which happens amazingly in, in, in music and, and, and the arts, right? Where you're building, helping them build relationships with peers um, and where you're, sharing power with them and helping them make decisions and and life decisions all those things that good arts educators are doing well that how that how they're doing it is the most critical thing that is highly predictive of SEL growth and we call it a positive youth development approach but i think it's it's um it's very much relational and relationships and how relationships are um, developed are, are the most critical predictor of SEL growth. And Chad, I think some of the things you were talking about, you know, just being that adult that young people can go to and talk about things. And there's a way that the arts make young people vulnerable and have us open up to have conversations about our emotions and our feelings because music brings out emotions and feelings. And there's a way that in creative spaces, young people can really take big risks um, and challenge themselves to, to do things they might not have otherwise done and, and in a very, very supported environment with adults who are who are helping them stretch and grow into new roles, into new ways of being. And so while having those social workers are really, really important and um, for everybody, including our staff right now, because staff are having to deal with their own and we're doing a youth uh, a youth workers speak out event. And I was just with the staff and some of those are on your team, Chad. Um, they're just talking about the amazing pressure of the moment, the amount of amount of need that there is in the community, especially in communities of color who are experiencing chronic stress um, and then their own on top of that, coupled on top of it. But um, but to me, it's the the adults that are already there and have these strong relationships with young people and have really built that kind of culture with young people are in, an incredibly important resource in, in our social and emotional health right now in communities and should be valued as, as such, as, as valuable resources in those communities because those relationships are, are critical. For sure. Uh, Peter, I want to talk to you for a little while. Uh, you have really led our research efforts in the past 12 months at the We Are Music Foundation. And as we speak about all the time, it's, it's really a research-led and data-based uh, grant process. And uh, tell us more about uh, your journey into the foundation and also uh, how we're thinking at this foundation about our research efforts. Well, um, yeah, it's uh, hard to believe it's been almost a year and it's it's been great. Um, uh, and uh, as I guess some of you know, I uh, am very close friends with uh, Laura Goldwater, who's, uh, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the senior members within WAM. And um, she knew me in my prior life as somebody who did a lot of due diligence and was was sort of in my, my so-called third act. Um, but um, you know that third act really does uh, involve doing something you know meaningful for for you know the world and uh, trying to lever the skills that I have. And uh, so it's just a great intersection of you know time and opportunity and um, I think just more generally where we are in the world with you know the things that we can do as evidenced by a lot of the great work that uh, you know both Kim and, and Chad have done. Um, and so, you know, we've set up this this research program, um, you know, with really kind of four key pillars, and they are to be uh, a force multiplier, where we help, um, you know, all of our grantees maximize their impact and that growth of the impact in the future. Um, you know, we want to uh, reach as many people as we can, do as much good as we can, and we, we're convinced that by measuring it well, we can manage it better. Um, uh, it's not to say it's impossible without, without a lot of these tools, but, um, you know, again, there are so many uh, interesting things that we can do now with the data sets and uh, surveys, and again, Kim illustrates a lot of this, you know, really quite brilliantly. Um, that we can really, you know, help make a bigger impact, uh, all of the things being equal. Um, a, a second pillar is to be a, a, a force for scientific robustness within the research uh, arena that looks at the impact of music. And, you know, generally speaking, there's a lot of research that's done, um, but not all of it is, is, is really helpful. And um, we want to be the gold standard repository for 
the type of research that clearly demonstrates the uh, various positive links that that you know we know intuitively to be true, but relative to some other things like perhaps sports have just not been as well quantified or documented or had you know a, a really strong case made for it you know getting consistent funding. Um, third pillar is being a collaborator, uh, you know, to take these tools and technologies and, and really work in, individually with all the grantees that that uh, we have partnered with. And um, we think it helps them, you know, understand themselves better, tell their stories better, and again, you know, lever what, what we're, you know, collectively really good at. And then uh, lastly is to be a curator, um, and that's to, you know, be the, uh, again, repository of not just research that we develop with our grantees, but third party research that we think really demonstrates, again, you know, the direction of um, uh, where a lot of this is headed, both in terms of an evaluation and analysis perspective, but also in terms of the actual results. Um, and so this will be linked to our website. Uh, people will be able to access it and search it based on category or um, topic. And um, uh, we think this will be, you know, another uh, source of value added to the people that, that you know, partner with WAM in, in various ways. Um, but um, this is essentially what we're about. And I'm, I'm happy to say that I'm, I'm joined with a, a, a robust team that, um, you know, between uh, the six of us, we're, we're able to, um, you know, really lever uh, some of the tools that we have and, um, you know, build uh, what we think is a pretty robust tool. So yeah. that's it in a nutshell. No, that was a, that was a fantastic summary. Uh, and I want to come back to that. But first, Kim, yeah. what we hear this all the time. We hear nonprofits say, we want to measure more, but it would cost us fifty to hundred thousand dollars to bring in a consultant and do this all manually and send out surveys. And you know, uh, as a you know venture investor, I've always looked at uh, enterprise software and, and venture solutions to create efficiencies and workflow solutions. And, and so I, I thought to myself, there has to be a more efficient, more cost-effective way that takes advantage of. Of the cloud and, and and many of the you know tech things that are happening all around the world, and sure enough, uh, we we spoke and we for hours and hours about Hello Insight, um, which has dramatically grown in the past several years. Uh, it now serves over two thousand nonprofits. But tell us what the value adds if you're a nonprofit and you're listening to this uh, and you're thinking, how do we measure? social emotional learning? How do we improve, use this data to improve our programming and then show that data to corporations and people with money to raise more money for this category of music, which we know and we all support having a, a great impact. Tell us about why you why you built Hello Insights and, and, and why it's value add. Yeah, so I was an evaluation consultant for the past 30 years and I was really, it was, I had to ask myself a question at some point, does every nonprofit need a PhD on staff to prove their impact, right? And it seemed like a ludicrous question, but honestly it was where I was getting to because it felt like the demand for kind of rigorous um, scientific methods, but an an analytics as well was growing kind of greatly. And, you know, I was also a funder, so I was funding randomized control studies at the tune of half million, million, dollars a pop, right? These are massive studies. And there was a huge gap between those organizations who had access to those studies and those that didn't. And those that had access were growing exponentially and those that didn't weren't. And so I asked myself, you know, isn't there a better way to go about this? Isn't there a way that we could kind of crowdsource tools so that we could create them and validate them quickly and make sure that they were kind of not biasing any particular race, gender identity, class, et cetera, and make sure that we could benchmark across different kinds of young people and make sure that communities of practice could learn and are in real time, right? So it was really important to us when we developed Hello Insight that the tools not only be wonderful and robust and, and exceptional, but that frontline staff could use them and that they would tell us not only how are young people developing in terms of their social emotional well being, but what could you as a frontline staff do to promote that development? And for us, that was critical because 
you know, to the extent that there is money being spent on evaluation, all of the data goes up and out of the organization. And there's nothing wrong with that because everybody needs data to share with their funders and use to fundraise. But if the frontline staff aren't getting anything out of it, it is really, really hard to get them to gather and spend time gathering mm -hmm. data if they never see the results. So for us, we really wanted to make sure that frontline staff were learning something and were able to use that data to really dial into what do these young people need and how can we get it to them. And then we thought if frontline staff would really buy in that way, the data is really, really scalable. So then executive directors can learn and funders can learn and whole communities can learn, um, you know, as we'll learn more about music. And, and you can about. bring a more robust data set and survey mechanism effectively for a tenth of the cost of what it used to be. Uh, one percent of the cost. I mean, honestly, in, in many cases, but certainly a large percent of the cost. I mean, the average per person that purchases our platform is like two thousand dollars per year, right? Small nonprofits really have access to it. Whereas there's no way I could even enter. I couldn't. I grew to a point in my consultancy where I couldn't enter into a consultancy under one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars. I just couldn't take the work. A nonprofit can take your tool for a few thousand dollars and honestly accomplish what they could have with $100,000 before. It, yeah, it, it's I, faster, I, I more wish, effective, a better benchmark way. Exactly. I wish I'd had this tool as a consultant, honestly, because it would have just allowed me to do more of the other kind of work. Like I could have walked in with a tool that actually worked and benchmarked young people across the country with each other. It's much. It's it's a very yeah. quick and efficient way to kind of gather data data well mm -hmm. and I think at a level that's as as rigorous as what you get from a randomized control study and, and what got us really excited was when one of our grantees guitars over guns we found out was using the tool for for a few years of course Chad has been a leader and, and an early adopter of, of thinking about not just music program as a music program but thinking about mental health as you've heard and social emotional learning so how has the hello insight measurement process uh, helped you guys think about your programming and then also show impact to your donors? Yeah, so I think the other thing that's really uh, relevant is that it's in real time. You know, if you're, if you're, if you have a longitudinal study, you know, that's great because you're going to understand the impact of your program uh, on participants five years from now, but you're waiting five years for that data. I think one of the, the value adds of Hello Insight is to say like, all right, we've we've deduced what are the key elements of impact that predict that future success, like evidentially, like we, we know that these things are going to be the greatest factors in a child's success moving forward. And now in real time, your practitioners get to see is what I'm doing working or how well is it working? And what are the things, what are the milestones in our program that are able to be attributed to that growth? And throughout these points of the year that you have these milestones and you see the data change, it's really amazing to see students emerge in these capacities and, and, and grow in them. Uh, and then to be able to say, okay, hey, this team, you know, is doing a really great job with this thing. What are they doing that's so unique? Mm -hmm. And what can we learn from them? And, and why is it that they're, the, they're promoting peer bonds in such a special way? Like, what activities are they doing? And so you're really starting to reduce your curriculum to experiences that kids are having instead of what you're trying to have them, you know, mm -hmm. to your point earlier, you can't learn empathy from a flashcard. So what is it about music? And this is, and sports are a great analogy for this too, but, but not every kid's going to be an athlete. So in music, you have this incredible individual pursuit of what you want to express then you have the ability to play with other individuals in a group setting mm -hmm. and you have this peer relationship happening and then you take that leap of vulnerability to get onto stage and put yourself out there and connect with a broader audience with a community and like at each of these stages of development you're building your social emotional capacity but now you actually get to see all right this is how this mm -hmm. is how it works this is what we're doing that's actually working there uh, and for us, that's 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 invaluable. I mean, certainly for our foundation, having data is is critical to understanding and quantifying impact, and um, being able to bring more funds to bear to improve programming and 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 expand. And, and and as you know, we're not just looking, you know, for static programs. We're trying to find the very best in class 
music nonprofits that are focused on social causes and ones that have great leaders and that can expand their programming nationwide and, and truly, truly grow. Uh, Peter has recently authored a white paper as part of our research efforts, which will be part of our research repository, uh, looking at a case study with guitars over guns and their use of Hello Insight. What impressed you, Peter, um, either from a survey or benchmarking perspective or um, a data integrity perspective when you thought about um, the aspects of the adoption? Well, I think Chad uh, enumerated a lot of these points pretty well. I mean, it's it's the way that she has linked the uh, um, uh, uh, ties that we know exist between SEL and uh, overall outcomes, <clears throat> but you know, mapping those to, to to very specific things that happen within nonprofits like Guitars Over Guns, and so. Um, you know, the other thing is that it, it, it was, again, scientifically robust in a, in a period where it's, it's hard to do that, frankly, because the data collection is a challenge. I and mean, we've already addressed some of that, but, um, you know, the technology is not so ubiquitous enough that we can do, for example, control group comparisons yet, um, although I think that's the direction we, we clearly want to uh, uh, head towards. Um, uh, I think the other thing was, was frankly, the accessibility. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of papers that we have in our repository that, you know, are, are you know, perhaps um, uh, much more deep than they are wide and uh, don't tie a lot of these, these important concepts together. And I think, um, you know, Kim's really strikes a nice balance. So, you know, looking uh, not only at our, our grantees that we're, we're, we're uh, all partnering with, but, you um, you know what what we know has already been taking place with not just guitars over guns but i think we can say there's another one of our our affiliate grantees that will also be working with with kim um so um it, it's it's uh i mean i guess to put it bluntly the the lowest hanging fruit that we have right now um for you know doing what we think we want to do to measure the actual impact one of the things that was interesting to me was that if you're a new organization and you wanted to go down the route of, of doing everything manually, you're starting from scratch when it comes to benchmarking. And, and Kim, I think I, I remember talking to you, you telling me you had over 300,000 data points uh, that could, has evolved into creating appropriate benchmarking. Um, is, that, is that correct? And, and, and how do you think about um, when you're creating surveys for students and, 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 and the parents to understand uh, cr crafting that and benchmarking things correctly? Yeah. I mean, we work really hard on the benchmarks because what we're trying to do is not benchmark guitars over guns to, you know, leap in New York City. What we're trying to do is compare young people with, with similar attributes, right? Because we know that that one of the biggest predictors of growth in social emotional learning is where you start. Not surprisingly, right? So what we're trying to do is is match young people who are just like you in our data set with other young people just like you and saying how you would typically see growth. And so when we provide the benchmark, what we're, what we're saying is that your young person is being compared to young people like them in terms of where they come in in their SEL development and their, you know, age, their gender identity, ethnicity. And then we we say, you know, if those young people are growing in kind of a typical way or, or if they're not growing quite as fast and what it is that your program is doing or not doing that's promoting it or not growing it as you know as quickly as, as you might want. And so we really try to dial into um, into those kinds of matching scenarios. And then um, Peter, to your other point, we do a lot of for field studies when we when there's when there's enough data, right? When, when there's enough music programs in our data system, we can lift that up and we do something called propensity score matching rather than randomized control studies. So we don't say no program program, right? What we say is, is there something about music that's particularly unique when we look at it compared to maybe a traditional after school program or a non arts based program? And so can we see where there's changes there? Because some of the challenges as a funder of these randomized control studies is you really couldn't control whether the young people who weren't in the study were going to anything else because they were, I mean, they're not in a box, you know, they're doing stuff, you know, they're going, if they didn't get into your program, they're going somewhere else, right? So, you know, can we find ways to, to look at what's the unique contribution of music programming, maybe as compared to other types of programming? So that kind of study we can do in our data set. That's a great example. So Chad, what's the vision? Tell us how you want to grow guitars over guns. Um, what can you build in the next decade uh, and what's the vision? Yeah, so I, for us, I mean, 
creating that community of, of practice is really a huge part of it. Um, we see what we do is uniquely scalable in the sense that if you can understand, and this is true of coaches, teachers, you know, music mentors, whatever, if you can understand that the impact that you're making on a child goes beyond the thing that you're teaching them, uh, and understand the, the value of the relationship that you have. Uh, and you can do that in a space where a child feels like they can show up as their authentic self and be celebrated for that. Um, there is tremendous gains that are, that are possible. Uh, and we want to help do that through our programming and then, and then you know, help other people learn how to do that through theirs. But um, we very easily see that we'll be able to reach um, 10,000 students annually um, by 2030, and, and honestly, that's that's seeming like less and less aggressive as a, of a goal um, as we continue to grow. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is, you know, if we are able to collect uh, data in a realistic way, and we are able to know that that data is valid, and we're able to use it in real time, um, then it's not about having data be this like pass fail thing for a funder. It's about informing the work that we do and continuing to leverage the brilliance within the organization, within the other, I mean, Kim mentioned Leap. I, I just met um, uh, somebody from Leap last week and they're another brilliant program that's using Hello Insight. And now we're talking about, well, what does your curriculum look like and how are you structuring it around the experiences that your kids are having? Like those kinds of things and understanding that in this, in this kind of landscape of the nonprofit sector that we're not competing with each other for resources so much as is able to leverage each other's brilliance, then mm -hmm. we're really going to see a lot bigger impact than the 10,000 students a year that we're going to be able to serve. That, that, that is great. Uh, and we're obviously very supportive. Uh, we're all music foundation of, of what you've built and, and how you continue to measure, show impact uh, and, and what you're growing here. Thank you for your, your hard work in all this. Uh, and, and Kim, I think the efficiency, the data, the networking uh, information is, is really the key. If you don't have, if you don't know, it's hard to fix anything. It's hard to show people impact. And I think what your tool and your science and your, 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 your 30 years of work has done uh, can really catalyze what we're doing in music overall as a category uh, and show more measurement, more data to, to those who are funding. Uh, Peter, uh, We've got questions. I know we're going to shift to the Q and A part of this for uh, about ten minutes. What do we got? Well, I guess you know to, to maybe tee things up. Uh, I, I'd like to tie a few of the the points that were raised together here, and so uh, for both you know Chad and Kim, uh, but maybe starting with Chad. Um, you know, Chad, you mentioned uh, breaking down barriers uh, in your comments earlier, and um, uh, you know, with uh, the pandemic and all, all the challenges that we've had, uh, you know, it seems like there are, there are more barriers than than we've had before. But you know, specifically as it relates to uh, you know providing some of these uh, psychological, um, I'm not sure services is the right word, but um, uh, uh, what, what you had described, you know, with your uh, internal hiring as well as, you know, collaborating with the schools, you know, a lot, a lot of the schools, of course, you know, don't move very fast and have been maybe forced to move quick in this, this, this pandemic. Has that created opportunities to, to, you know, break down some of these internal organizational barriers and, and deliver more than you might otherwise have done? And uh, if that's so, are, are there still some, some of those barriers that need to be broken down? Uh, yes, <laughs> to a lot of that. Um, so COVID has certainly presented a lot of barriers um, that didn't exist before, but it's also exposed a lot of things that we were able to kind of get around before. And I think, you know, to your point around the things that we're offering now, um, suicide hotline in Miami was up 800%. Domestic violence was through the roof. But those challenges existed and we were somewhat set up to handle them, maybe not at the volume uh, that they started to present themselves, but we were set up to handle them because those problems existed before. And so I think um, from, from mitigating the challenges that our students are going through, uh, community and progress moves as a function of trust and trust is built over time and through relationships and it's why music is so powerful it's why 
you know, uh, the mentor to student and any kind of power dynamic relationship like that is so critical to protect and, and to do in, in a really ethical way. Um, and then to your other point around uh, kind of the virtual delivery mechanism that has presented itself. Um, one of my uh, colleagues in Miami uh, said something that, that is a quote we've kind of all adopted, but all of us are now tech companies and we're all dealing with uh, that aspect of this work. And so, yeah, we are able to deliver um, the programming that we do in a virtual way. There's no replacement and, and I don't care what program you are, uh, at least on the musical side, but like there's no replacement for being in person, the body language, the cues, the things that you pick up on a one-to-one -one basis. But what we've learned as an extension of delivering our program virtually over the last two years is that you are capable of building a safe feeling space. And, and when I say safe space, I don't necessarily mean a physically safe space. That is obviously part of it. But most importantly is a safe that feels, that feels safe emotionally for kids to show up and explore who they are free from the judgment and like if you can finally put that armor that you've been carrying around all day where you're so afraid to, to show up differently than the kids you know in your peer group and and actually like be celebrated for who you are like that that is really at the core of what we are doing in terms of building community mm -hmm. um and if that can be transported virtually then that opens the door to all kinds of opportunities music yep. and beyond yep. and that's that's really what we've learned as a result of COVID. That's a very good point. If you can extend music into the virtual world, you have scalability uh, and the safe state space isn't just a physical space. Um, Kim, we're getting a lot of comments. How should nonprofits get in touch with Hello Insight? <laughs> so give us 20 seconds on, on how someone who's out there, if they are interested in learning more about you and your, your, your company, how they can do that. Well, you can go to helloinsight.org or you can also just email me directly at kim at helloinsight.org. Okay, very so that's good. That's pretty simple. <laughs> okay. Uh, Peter, what else do we have? So um, I guess, uh, uh, hang on, I have this all written down here. Um, so uh, Kim, uh, sports space youth programs, uh, you know, this is something that you've had a lot of experience with. And I think we, we've again uh, addressed this, you know, in some ways uh, in the, the presentation so far, but can you talk about maybe some of the differences between how sports based programs are, are measured and some of the things that we can learn, um, maybe even vice versa? Um, yeah, I think, you know, one thing is, is that you know, we approach every tool that we create as a as a community, kind of like Chad. I think we really have we really lean into community, and so you know, there's we have a variety of different tools and resources that we've created. So we created a sports um, a sports tool specifically that looks at um, social emotional learning, but also looks at the the impact that the the specific um, issues that come up related to being on a team, right? A, a team identity and um, the different ways that coaches um, deal with young people. And so, you know, we started um, much like we're starting now in music, where we started bringing folks together and inviting them to come into the platform and to learn together. So there's not only the data that you get in the real time data, but we're often hosting community meetings to understand what are people learning? How are they seeing what we're measuring? What are they learning out of the platform? And then, for example, with um, we recently put out a study that showed the impact that sports was having on young people, particularly young men of color. And I think what we're learning there is that um, there's a few reasons that that seems to be happening because we're, we, from our own data, what we're seeing is that young men in particular were doing uh, well in developing social emotional learning when they felt really connected to the coach, but also when they were being challenged or when they were being stretched at just that right, that right pressure point where not too much, but, but enough that they were continuously being pressured in a good way to grow. Whereas young women were, that was not working for them whatsoever. That, that did not work for them whatsoever. They needed to feel like somebody was um, sharing power with them and really, uh, you know, kind of under, kind of um, helping them make decisions, helping them feel part of the decision-making team within sports-based programs. So 
So I think some of those are very transferable probably into the arts um, and probably some of the things that, that maybe Chad, you're seeing in your data too. I think one of the things when we look specifically at arts programs so far that we're seeing that's really unique is that one thing that we measure is a sense of contribution and giving back. And we're seeing that in arts, pro arts programs in particular are great at growing that skill set in young people. Um, and Chad, I would argue that a lot of the, the music and production work that young people do, you know, has, a, has that sensibility to it. And so I think that development of contribution is unique um, in arts. Um, as well, but I think there's some similar there's some similarities that Chad's called out, and there's some some differences. Um, the other thing I would say that we're learning there is we're do doing further research into why young men of color are doing so well. Is we're looking at um, how how coaches are being brought up through the program in the community. So a lot of the coaches are from the communities and look like young people from the community and have experience with those communities and are trusted mentors from within the community. And that's a really critical feature of, of a lot of the sports programs we're looking at. And um, Chad, I know that that's also a critical feature of a lot of the teaching artists that you have. Yeah, and, and, and you think you think that tattoo where you have to think about how to pair mentors, mentees, and you're in a lot of underserved communities, and how, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, the first and most important point to make is that representation matters. Um, I think it's true that when you look at great coach and athlete relationships through the history of time, you know, it, it's it's agnostic. Like, right, you get you get. Bill Jackson and Michael Jordan, or you know, like these, these, these combinations where you do get that right amount of push and pull and respect for the player and respect for the coach, and you end up getting the best out of that player, like that is absolutely endemic to sports. And I think it's endemic to any of like those coaching relationships. And that's true of music too. I think the thing that the arts provide that's so unique is the ability to center programming around youth voice and to have youth be driving what programming looks like and so i that's where i think it's really unique but all those same applications of coach to player and and how much to push them and then how much to show up like those are really true i'm really curious kim if, if those same things that you're seeing in the sports uh data translate to the arts with the with respect to like the coach uh player relationship and teaching artists and um young artists and it's really interesting, Chad. I think it was, it was fascinating because I think one of the things is like how, you know, how much is the coach successful in getting the, the, the young athlete to be a superstar athlete? And then there's another question, which it might be slightly different, which is how good is the coach at getting the young person to develop socially and emotionally, which are two different, which, which may be two different trajectories. Um, and it's also true in the arts, right? Where you can, there's a lot of arts programs that really push, you know, and, 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 and are trying to develop young artists who are going to be lifelong professional artists. And there's that, that distinction. So, um, but I mean, I think that there's a lot of overlap and I would absolutely agree with you wholeheartedly that in the arts, that, that, um, that, uh, is a unique feature. I think there's a couple unique features of the arts. One is that there's not a right answer, which I think is a unique environment for young people to be in. And because there's no right environment, a right answer, it allows them to be create, create the right answer. And that's, that's so unique to almost any other youth setting, honestly. But, but look, it should be said that most likely yeah. our daughters are not going to play on the World Cup soccer team, and they're not going to play in Carnegie. Yeah. But they better get social emotional learning along the way in these programs. Right. Okay. And, 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 and the more we're thinking about how we deliver the program, not just what the program is, the more we are able to measure the impact along the way and think about program changes, uh, how people in underserved communities react to the right and different types of of mentors, how we create the safe space, as Chad mentioned, how we measure it, how we then translate that back to funding sources to grow programs. Uh, it's, a, it's an iterative process. Uh, it, it requires technology and tools, years of data collection, 
uh, centralized research, which we're trying to do with the We Are All Music Foundation. Uh, and it, it requires the corporation to our patient and, and ultimately can expand funding for programs like Guitars Over Guns and, and grow this nationally. Um, Peter, I think we have time for maybe one more before we have to go off air. Is there Absolutely. anything that, is, that you're seeing out there that is, uh, we want to get, get after? Yeah, there's uh, one from the chat about, uh, uh, for Kim, um, are, are you um, working with the Arts Education Partners uh, Partnership uh, Research at all, Kim? Are you familiar with them? I am not, no. Yeah, we're, we're I'm not sure. Really aware of them. I mean, we, 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 uh, we, we know them, but we've not had any, any formal tie up yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware, but I don't, I don't think we have any formal tie up, but I'm also not aware of every one of our partners, unfortunately, but not that I know of, but it would be great to be aware of them. Okay. Um, I, I just want to say a big shout out to Jens and Felicia and Adam for the comments in the chats. Um, just to put a cap on the point before, I think one of the things that's so important that the data really helps with is uh, to understand that like what got you here won't get you there. Like the reason the Guitars of Our Guns started is because I had a transformational experience in a juvenile detention center, realizing the impact that as a musician, I could have on the life of a young person that looked nothing like me, that came from no, nothing of, of the same background as me. And that got us to a really amazing place. What will get us to the next level is you know, and we see this in the data, like that our kids, when they get to see somebody that looks like them, that's been through what they've been through, achieve and succeed and, and, and beat the odds, like, okay, now, now I know it's possible. And now I have another model of, of what I can aspire to and somebody to talk to that's been there and been through it. There's no replacement for that. My succession plan should not be somebody that looks like me, you know, like we, we need to continue to evolve as organizations and need to be able to say like, hey, you know, we haven't gotten it all right here and we need to continue to grow and continue to evolve. And a lot of that can be done through the things that we know because we hear and we learn them, but like we cannot continue to go without data and leave our blind spots unchecked. And, and we need to be able to have a, a culture of accountability there as well. Accountability, uh, we agree. Uh, and, and that's a great way to close this out. A few of the last comments. Um, you can learn more about the We Are All Music Foundation at weareallmusic.org. Um, if you are a nonprofit seeking funding, there's a lot of ways to learn more about that on our website or reach out to Mary Crawford, our managing director. Um, look in the next week or two at our website also to see the exciting uh, new research repository, which is, I think, going to be a great central resource for our entire music community uh, from, from nonprofits to governments to corporations to uh, individuals that under want to understand the impact that music can have on all sorts of of, of impact and social causes people. Uh, so look forward to really, you know, getting that out there in the next few weeks. Uh, and obviously we're heading into grant season. So um, we look forward to really making a big difference in the next coming months as we've got a lot of work on our hands, evaluating a, a lot of groups uh, and, and figuring out which ones we think can measure, show us impact and expand and, and grow and scale. Um, and have the right leadership teams and sustainability to do it. So thank you very much, Chad, for your time, as always, uh, and, and the work you are doing at Guitars for Guns, Kim, the science. Your company is amazing. More courage, as you know, throughout this uh, other other nonprofits to look into Hello Insight and see how, how you can be helpful to their, their process. Um, and, and Peter, uh, you really transformed WAM's research efforts a year ago. And, and what we're doing here is just the beginning. So appreciate your hard work and, and efforts all around. Uh, so thanks audience for sticking with us for the full hour. Um, and uh, we will see you at some point in the future, a few months down the road for episode seven. Uh, so thanks very much, appreciate it.